These days, it seems more important than ever to not be a massive wang, which makes it all the sweeter we can gather round a table with some close friends, bask in the warmth and safety of affectionate companionship, and then take a blowtorch to their hopes and dreams. Which begs a question, what makes a board game mean? After all, chess is all about destroying your opponent's forces, but it's not really mean. That's a central function of the game. Rather, a mean game is one that gives you opportunities for major conflict, betrayal, and punishment that you don't don't necessarily have to take so that when you do it goes beyond the mechanical and into the personal you should have killed me when you had the chance not everyone likes games that encourage you to specifically and gleefully ruin your friends but those that do really do and hey you devilish souls I'm right there with you this is a collection starter and here are the 10 meanest board games ever made you've been warned number 10 munchkins so munchkins incredibly successful that's a good thing the hobby always needs more top -set selling titles beyond the usual family of household classics. It's a light, scrappy, cartoony little Viz magazine tinge parody of high fantasy and dungeon crawlers, but also, damn, a lot of gamers hate Munchkin. See, in the game, you and your friends play as adventurers trying to get to level 10. Picking up a whole load of wacky, tongue-in-cheek cards that let you buff up your character, skip levels, cast spells. It's really silly stuff. So you go up a level primarily by beating monsters, but here's the thing. To defeat tougher monsters, you'll most likely have to ask for help from other players bribing, begging, threatening, negotiating. That can be a lot of fun, but the closer you get to level 10, not only will your friends refuse to help you, they'll start to actively sabotage you with their cards. One lets a player steal one of your levels, which is some nonsense. Or more likely, they'll just watch you die so they can loot your cards once you're dead. And man, that can really make you feel a way about your friends. If you like messing with each other, great. But the game does have a tendency to drag on with everyone just tripping each other up over and over again before they can get to the finish line. Number nine, the estates. Oh, the number of times I've gotten awfully cross playing the estates. In the game, you're playing as corrupt construction companies raising buildings on these three lines of empty lots. On your turn, you select one of these pieces to be up for auction. Whoever wins it gets to put it on the board, where it becomes either an unfinished building or maybe a roof, which then finishes off a building. And the game ends when two of these rows are filled with finished buildings, but here is where the game bears its incredibly sharp teeth. Tall buildings score more points. That's nice, but only for whoever's the same color as the topmost cube. That's mean. The buildings in the two finished rows score points for whoever owns them. That's nice, but all the buildings in the unfinished row have those points taken away from players who own them. That's mean. You can bid for these pieces, which can shorten a row, making that row quicker and easier to finish. That's nice. Other players can buy these pieces and use them to extend the row your buildings are on, making it much less likely they'll be finished, and now you're going to lose all your points when the game ends, and that's when fists hit the table and we share some carefully chosen words. There are so many ways to hurt people in the estates, but it's such a great and addictive little system of bidding and backstabbing. Number eight, City of Horror. In most zombie movies, the real monsters aren't the zombies, but the survivors who lose their humanity along the way. Ditto in City of Horror, where the real monsters are the assholes around the table that leave you to die and eat your snacks as they do it. In the game, you'll be controlling a group of survivors hiding out in various buildings, fending off the horde of shambling brain enthusiasts. You end by surviving as long as you can and getting as many of your characters as possible to the chopper, insert gif of Arnold Schwarzenegger. But here's the thing, a lot of the game is governed by voting, because what would a post-apocalypse be without self-imposed governance and the resentment that brings? You vote to divvy out supplies which arrive each round, most of your characters have one-off powers that can sway vote, and meanest of all, when zombies overrun a building, instead of them swarming in and everyone dying, people in that building hold a vote to see which one character gets sacrificed to the mob. And that's tense. It's a fascinating little game that uncannily manages to recreate the feeling of a group of people turning into self-serving monsters when their backs are against the wall, but it also gets real personal real quick. Number seven, Survive Escape from Atlantis. Ah, the classic game of sharks and bastards. Survive is a game that sees you play a bunch of people on an island slowly sinking into the sea, trying to board boats and sail to the safety of the surrounding shores. Any islander that makes it to the shore when the game ends will net you the number of points on their bum. Hey, nice bum, islander. Here's the problem though. Every player's turn, that player gets to choose which island tile disappears into the sea, starting with beach tiles, then forest, then mountain. Any player pieces that are on a tile that gets removed 
falls into the sea. Sorry about that. As the game progresses, more and more sea creatures will join the survivors in the sea. Creatures that players can control using this evil creature die. Whales destroy boats, dumping everyone the drink. Sorry about that. Sharks eat all player pieces in the same space as them, permanently removing them from the game. Sorry about that. And sea serpents eat boats and people all in one go. Not at all sorry about that. It's a vicious little game of deliberately destroying each other as you flee for your lives, like Titanic, but everyone's Billy Zane. Number six, Citadels. Ah, Citadels, you little bugger. In this game, you gain money, use money to build cards. The first person to build eight cards ends the game and has end game bonus points. So far, nice and simple. The unique selling point of Citadels, or the unique reason to kick the game into a factory fire, is each game there's a bunch of rolls that all do different things. And each turn, the roll cards will be handed around with you picking which roll you want to be for that turn from the ones that are left. Almost all the rolls dick over the other players. The warlord destroys other people's built cards. The thief steals the entirety of someone else's money. The magician can swap hands with someone else. And the assassin can make one roll skip their entire turn. The assassin can get in the bin. In the current edition of the game, there's 27 rolls to mix and match from. And the fact that a lot of their powers are about attacking rolls rather than players, that means because the rolls are largely chosen in secret, it makes trying to screw each other over a fun little game of bluff and counter bluff. But there's no denying that it's borderline impossible to win citadels without royally screwing someone over at least once. Number five, Spartacus, a game of blood and treachery. Yes, it's a board game based on that Spartacus show you haven't seen, but are aware has lots of blood and boob. Well, Spartacus, the board game, sees you playing as rival families from that show, bidding on cards, betting on gladiator fights, which players actually fight with dice in real time, which is cool, and buying these intrigue cards, allowing players to hit each other with schemes, with schemes mostly consisting of kicking one of your opponents in the metaphorical wallet or the metaphorical kidneys. There are lots of ways to be cruel to your fellow players in Spartacus, bluffing them into bidding loads on worthless cards, having their prize gladiator executed if they lose a match, which you do with the thumbs down gesture, which is rad, or something worse than all of these. See, all of these schemes that mostly hurt other players require a certain amount of influence to play. However, if you don't have that much influence, you can still play the card if you strike a deal with another player and use their influence as if it was your own. As soon as that happens, you can turn around, play the scheme on the player who just helped you, which makes you the biggest monster in all the Roman Empire, more so than Caligula, which is saying something. Number four, Nemesis. I love Nemesis, but be warned, it's a chunk, a big box, big price tag, but it's also everything you could ever love about the Aliens franchise in a box. You're on a ship, aliens are attacking, and depending on your secret mission, you want those motherfucking aliens off your motherfucking spaceship, or you're working for the not Wayland yutani Corporation, and you quite like to stop those players because, you know, profits somehow. There is a lot of rules in Nemesis, too much to cover here, maybe in a future Masterpieces video, coy finger to the lips, but the heart of the game is traveling around, fighting off beasties and trying to complete tasks vital to your own personal success, like privately fixing or breaking the engines, or making sure the ship's actually heading to Earth or somewhere else entirely, because yes, everyone has a different secret objective that they can't win the game without completing. Some are good, like send a signal and make sure you all get home safe. Aw, oh, cute. Some are bastards, like be the only survivor, or even worse, make sure player three specifically dies. Damn, Nemesis, there's mean, there's mean, and then there's locking a player who thought you were his ally in a room with an alien queen because you really want them in particular to die. Carter Burke cruelty at its most despicable. Number three, lifeboats. Lifeboats is kind of a cross between Survive Escape from Atlantis and City of Horror. You're in boats trying to make it to shore and also voting yourself into some broken friendships. There's a number of boats and all the players mix up the sailors of their colour between them. Every turn, one of these boats is going to spring a leak, decided by all the players voting with their cards. Starting player breaks ties. Any boat that springs a leak has to throw one of the occupants overboard to die. How do you decide who gets thrown overboard? That's right, a vote! Start Starting to see where the meanness comes in, then one of the boats moves closer towards the islands, decided by, yep, another vote, and then the next round, 
another leak, another poor soul hurled into the drink. If a boat ever has more leaks than pieces in it, that boat will sink. And that's the core of the game right there, meaning the whole thing is a constant stream of bargaining, threats, teaming up on one poor player and muttered oaths of revenge. Every player has three of these captain cards, which means if they're the only one playing that card in a certain vote, they'll automatically win that vote, which is a nice way for outnumbered players to even the odds. But otherwise, this is an utterly cutthroat game of alliances, arguments, and tension. Certain game groups will absolutely love it, and I fear those game groups. Number two, Intrigue. How can such a small box contain so much cruelty? Intrigue is a tiny little game in which each player has a court made up of four locations, each paying out a different amount of money every round, and eight of these scholars, two priests, two scribes, two doctors, and two scientists. Throughout the game, people will be sending their scholars to your court, hoping you'll take them in and give them a job, and double hoping you'll install them in the 10,000 ducat part of your court, earning them a thick 10 Gs every round. However, you you can only have one scholar of each type working in your court. So what if someone else's scribe wants to replace a scribe already working there? What if two scientists apply to work there at the same time? How do you choose? Why bribery, of course. Sweet filthy kickbacks. But here's a trick that makes intrigue uniquely mean. In most board games, bribes make a deal binding. If you agree to do a thing for cash and they hand it over, you have to do it. In intrigue, no deals are binding. Someone can pay you 6,000 ducats to give them a job in the highest paying area of your court. You take their money and then give them the lowest paying. Or maybe yellow and green both bid for their scientists to work for you. Green's in last place and only has 2,000 to offer. Yellow bids 5,000. You take Take yellow's money and install green because they're less of a threat. It is a raucous symphony of bastards, broken promises, and cursed family names. And number one, diplomacy. Of course. I mean, the game's unofficial tagline is ruining friendship since 1959. It's brutal. In Risk, in order to conquer a country, you roll dice. Diplomacy takes dice out of the equation, meaning the only way to move into a region is if the attacking army has more support than the defending army. Players can support themselves from neighboring areas, but way more likely, they'll rely on the support of their biggest air quotes ever written, allies. And man, no betrayal plunges a knife deeper into your soul than a diplomacy betrayal. The game depends on you breaking off and having private chats with people, investing serious time and emotional weight into a plan, and then you write down your orders, reveal them all at the same time, and act them out right there and then. Hey, maybe your ally helped you this time. Maybe they'll do what they promised. Maybe the next time and the time after that. Until that one time where they completely abandon you and side with your opponent who's actually been pulling their strings the entire time, and it breaks your heart. Unless, of course, you ditch your ally first, the little idiot. Diplomacy is a long, unforgiving game where if you lose a bunch of territory, you spend ages fighting from underneath. The idea of spending all that time crafting a plan only for it to come crashing down at the whim of a chucklehead, to some, that's the most thrilling a board game can get. To others, that is the blueprint to grievous bodily damage. And that's our list. What's the meanest board game you've ever played? Any horror stories from a mean game gone wrong? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe to No Rolls Barred for more fun board game content. Get on board.